Welcome to your revision session for the upcoming GCSE exams. You may want to use the Google Doc that I've made for you as you work through this video. That will be shared on the classroom. Um, or if you need that, please email me directly and I will send that out to you. You can use that to make notes. You can use that to mind map. You can do it digitally on this device or you could print it out however you want. I've had feedback from students saying they've all done those things and found it useful. So pick whichever is going to work for you and then work work from there. Uh, each slide has lots of icons on and the document has those same icons on so to help you plan your labelling and your mind mapping as well. Let me know how you get on. Families around the world is the first topic that you're going to need to look at. So we'll divide it into class, age, gender and ethnicity. Sexuality is kind of excluded from this just by the basis that we're not talking about homosexual families. So there's an inbuilt bias or presumption there. The first type of family outside of Israel is usually referred to as a commune and they were more common in sort of 60s and 70s America. Uh, there's a stereotype there associated with kind of the hippie movement and popular culture around that time. Generally speaking, though, kibbutz is specific to Israel and um, a more Marxist. All of them have this idea of kind of a very flat class society um, or classless society. Everyone kind of works together for the good of the kibbutz. Children don't necessarily live with their parents for their whole life. They're sort of dormitories in some. And this idea of women playing the role of kibbutz mother where they, they look after all of the children. That could be one of the roles which frees other people up to work on the kibbutz. So I think about 2% of Israelis live in a kibbutz. It's not hugely common, it's very specific, but obviously it's quite interesting and it links really well to Marxism. So you can think about kind of the division of labor there and how it compares to the traditional nuclear family. Uh, the matriarchal family structure of the Caribbean, again, is caused a lot of controversy. But the idea that women across the family and across the extended family care for all of the children and share childcare duties and socialize the children is, is very much a cultural idea and one that is different to the, the traditional nuclear family. The extended families of South Asia, so we're really talking about the Indian subcontinent there, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Again, these are broad brush stereotypes, but very traditional gender roles is sort of one of the characteristics. Respect for the elders. And there's a debate about whether you have to live under the same roof quite literally, or whether sort of two houses together, or even on the same housing estate, the same street could be classed as an extended family where childcare, jobs, um, you know, a very close kind of familial bond is there and evident, and that leads to socialization and sharing of roles and responsibilities. The last one I've called kinship groups from sub-Saharan Africa. So if you think obviously everything below the Sahara, we're talking about a sort of mix of extended families. And I guess what would have been thought of centuries ago as kind of a tribal structure maybe, or when when you didn't have modernization or industrialization groups of families would live together in in very close proximity and kind of share roles so there's a lot of overlap in some respects in terms of the socialization aspects it's just the specific cultural ideals and norms and values might vary slightly but again i think the big skill here will be comparing it to the traditional nuclear family and particularly the cereal packet family so you may want to make a mind map here of different class, age, gender, ethnicity for each family type or color code them or however you want to organize your work here. A good case study you can also use in essays is China's one child policy. Now, I didn't talk about China in the last slide because of this, but given that communism and the links to Marxism 
are kind of one of the main reasons for the one child policy is interesting to use from a sociological point of view. You may have done this in geography, you may have done it in history too, but essentially as the 20th century progressed, the Chinese Communist Party began to limit the population in the 1970s because they were heading towards one billion. And, you know, the, the strain on resources, the strain on the economy, this is a country that had had famines earlier in the 20th century because of a booming population and other reasons. They, they started to bring in this one child policy. Now, the gender implications for this, the stories around um, girls not being as valued or, or aborted or, or, or other things are, are one aspect that we can think of here, too. There's lots you can unpack and probably way more than you'd want to put in an answer. But the fact that it didn't really apply in rural areas and it didn't apply to ethnic minorities also shows an interesting aspect to this because it's very much an urban idea and compare that to say industrialization in Great Britain during Marx's time during the Victorian era and the large families that were had is, is a very interesting contrast too. So you may want to make notes using the previous diagram where you add China in you may want to make your own separate notes and how you could incorporate that into a question but comparing it to kind of the the traditional nuclear family in the western world and the cereal packet family there's, there's a lot to unpack there so again it's a really useful case study to, to push answers on and get good detail from you will also want to revise ideas around marriage and divorce particularly divorce here is uh, some official statistics put into graph format of divorces and marriages in Great Britain from 1950 onwards to 2019. The faint grey line you can see is where the 1969 Divorce Act comes in and that isn't really implemented until 1971. What's really interesting though is obviously World War II has a massive impact on the population, marriage in general and families etc. And then this act in 1969 comes in and marriages and divorces go up. So we don't know the reasons for that. Obviously, there's no valid data here. And we don't know how many are perhaps remarriages or second marriages or whatever it might be. And again, with the Family Act uh, of 2013, where homosexual marriage is legalized and civil, um, civil partnerships uh, are in effect in Britain and these changing values are coming in, we see marriages go up again. So don't fall into a trap of thinking that as soon as the Divorce Act happens, it's just divorces are happening left, right and centre and marriage is kind of a, a dead institution. It's very much a billion pound industry still and very much uh, marriage is a social structure and a social institution alive in Britain and, and still happening. Again, obviously, we see divorces start to creep up at the very end of the graph in 2019. Don't know why that is. Um, but with the COVID pandemic, it would be interesting to see how marriages and divorces change on the official statistics too. You can probably draw your own conclusions as to which way those lines will go. But again, think about how this compares to what you know of traditional nuclear family, how this compares to what you've learned so far, the different sociologists and, and how you can include that and, and apply cages where necessary. So if you get a question on divorce, similar with the kind of families around the world or global family patterns or whatever you want to think of it as the comparisons to what the norm is in Britain versus what other things have happened and what other sociologists have noted are really important there. Here's an essay question that I've made up essentially, which you could apply some of these ideas to that we've been talking about. So if you've got a question like this, obviously it'd be a a lovely question discuss how far sociologists agree that divorce is good for society this is a nice open question you can apply cages you've got functionalist feminist marxist ideas that you can apply here too uh, and some new right ones as well so if you're thinking about divorce obviously you want to talk about marriage traditional family types the rapper pause etc but some sociologists might say well it would allow you to find a new or a better spouse so in terms of sort of functionalism, yes, it would break down the traditional nuclear family, but you could reform that. And there's less stigma now, as the last one says on the arguments for. And that might mean that there's better socialization because you're in a happier family, particularly if you've got someone like 
domestic abuse or mistreatment. So you can bring in a lot of functionalist and feminist arguments there and think about the different studies you might apply and how you could do that. Against that, you might spark more welfare dependency. I mean, the new right kind of talk about single mothers and the underclass in the same way, really, because obviously single mothers don't have the economic function that the traditional nuclear family do. Um, is their argument, not my argument, is their argument. But generally speaking, it might lead to more welfare payments. Um, also divorce, if it does lead to a single parent family, you then get the lack of equal socialization. So you've got both sides of functionalism there, as it were. And again, a decline of traditional norms and values. So you can apply a lot of sociology there. You don't need to do every sociologist and every argument. And you can talk about class, gender, perhaps even ethnicity as well, if, you, if you're if linking it to global um, family types that we've talked about. So you could, you could pick lots of different ways to go with that question. And then you can really up your grade by by doing that and practicing. Well, how can I link different topics, different family types, different changes over time and different sociologists? So use that essay plan. Have a go at writing the essay and I'll happily mark it for you or um, doing a mind map or whatever else is going to help you revise to answer a question like this.